Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mokalover and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign in TNO in which we are playing as the Free State of Magadan. Now, I've played as them before, but I went down a certain route that was a lot of fun under verbal or verbal. But this time we're going to go down a certain other route just because someone's asked if I could do this route. So, if you'd like to read about the Free State of Magadan, please go ahead. And boom. And then boom. Yeah, fighting here in the Far East is one of my probably least favorite things, but... Oh well, but we need to talk about the true heir to Abim, the Russian F party, as it was known in Habin is now gone. Long displeased with Rajevsky's policies and rhetoric, Matkovsky and his wing of the party is taking control of Magadan and are now molding it to suit their purposes. No longer shall the party struggle in the mud, while the whole of Russia suffers. No more thuggery, no more rhetorics of hatred. Mother Russia calls us to her fold to rescue her from ruin before Matkovsky can do his duty for his motherland, however. He must rule alone without constraint and free of disloyalty. While he trusts his wing of the pod, he must crush dissent among the ranks. All those suspected of loyalty to Rajevsky and fa shall find themselves purged. With his political hold over Magadan secure, Matkovsky will do a sacred duty, one that he has to steal himself to do ever since the heady days of Habim. Under his guidance, Russia shall stand again, st soul strong and unrivaled in rebuilding the wastes. Or just building the wastes. News of horror drifts from the west. German terror bombings, bandit raids, wars fought by Russian against Russian. On the edges of Far Eastern Russia, Magadan is remote and sheltered from the troubles that plague the rest of the motherland. Due to its distance, however, Magadan is not much. Located in the sparsest region of Russia, both in population and resources, there is not much here that is of use for the eventual liberation and reunion of Russia. But Gosky will change that. The officials of his party shall travel the streets and outskirts of Magadan. For workers willing to join him in his crusade, they will build the roads and telegram poles, small workshops and manufactories. When the day of liberation dawns upon the dark body of Russia, laid to rest by failures of the Reds and the crimes of the Germans, they shall find themselves richly rewarded by their duty and dedication, for Matkovsky shall, not, shall let no faith in him go to waste. And we will do Siberian factories? Yes, please. Magadan, as has been noted before, is remote and isolated from the rest of Russia. In the poor town of Magadan itself, the industry that exists is small and not particularly tailored to the production of war material, fortunately, in the Far East. This lack of indus industry persists everywhere, as the industrial center of Vladivostok, developed in the time of the Reds, is now lost to the Japanese and Manchurians. To put it briefly, all who we fight in the East are on the level playing ground. No opportunity passes Matkovsky by, however. From the west of Siberia, he shall craft factories, with the express intent of waging a war, not small-time conflicts between children. The party shall arm and train the soldiers of Magadan as soldiers, not bandits and possessing a higher ideal. Additionally, no citizen sheltering under his wings, or under the wings of the party shall know poverty or lack. Let this be an example, and a vision of Russia is to come. And we can do some stuff for world development, but we're doing some looting, but whatever. The last said the true. Matkovsky steadied his glasses against his nose, peering down at a piece of paper with rows and rows of names written all over it. A list of Rozhevsky's, uh, suspected loyalists. He looked up to discover a room packed to the brim with books from his white army days, old decaying American newspapers, and in the far corner shrouded in the dark and old gramophone gathering rust and dust. The sight of the thing brought a smirk to Matkovsky's face. Uh, no, <clears throat> the old Habin building, the dances and parties, and above it all, the electric swastika, promising another future for the Russians stranded there. The doorbell rang, shaking Matkovsky from his reverie. Two gruff men, dressed in the party uniform, entered. In a small and messy room, they stood out as an oddity, almost barbaric even. Their feet thumped loudly on the wooden floors as they attempted clumsy salutes, one lean. With breezes of blonde hair peeking through the party cap, the other stocky, with a bulge of his stomach plain to the eye. After a few moments of awkward silence... Matkovsky stared at them before finally saying, Well, with trembling voices, they gave him the names of the people they had purged today. Matkovsky gave him a generous smile. Thank you, you, you may go. When he heard the door knob latch itself closed, he turned back to his list, Sergei A, Bruno B, Nicholas C. He crossed them out, dabbing the names in his thick black ink, snuffing them out forever from the history of the Russian fascist party. Balancing his glass of whiskey from his hands, Matkovsky looked at his reflection against the murky liquid before taking a sip. The hours went by. The doorbell rang, and men came and did their salutes, telling them of the names disappearing from the list. Sometimes, when the wind was right, he could hear the crack of rifle fire somewhere deep in the woods. It was nighttime by the time he finished the list. He gently pushed the men out, thanking them for their job well done. After they left, he bolted the door behind him. Turning to his gramophone, he decided that he would dance to the memories of Habim. He turned it on and let the good times roll. The boss has a lot of work to do, my friends. A lot of work. And while I know I've said I've already read this before, like... I still want to read it again just because it's been a long time since I've actually played this, so... Yeah, if, if there are routes in, in TNO that you want to take and play as, let me know in the comments below. Like, seriously, like, i played almost as e every nation that has unique content in TNO, but I haven't gone down different specific routes. I know at the time of this recording I've not done Yunnan yet, which is going to be a pain in the butt, but if you'd like to read about the modern Bogatir, please go right ahead. Which I know I'm saying wrong, but whatever. And we're going to try... Well, that's a lot of political power, wow! Holy crap! All in a day's work, my friends. Alexander Pavlov. A Pavlov. Stood in a chilly air, not warm enough coat around him, facing the leader of the RFP security team he had assigned to the mission. 
Though perhaps security team wasn't uh, the best term to describe them, since they were really more than ill-equipped thugs, they had no qualms about following orders though, and the boss had little money to spare, so Pavlov supposed they would have to do. Have the preparations been made, he asked the man before him. Yes, sir, the security team replied confidently. Our men are positioned all around the warehouse, you're ready to begin the attack on your command. Pavlov nodded at that, looking over the warehouse with that smile that many in his life described as unsettling. He understood why perfectly well, he enjoyed his job to an extent that most wouldn't consider normal, and he never once felt the slightest hesitation about ordering lives to be snuffed out like candles at night. No one understood, all right. He just didn't care. Anything for fascism, no matter what it involved. Firewell and take no quarter. Aldan? Shaka? Oh, no, terror. The stench of sweat. The fear of degenerates. Incapable of standing up for themselves. Another early morning break in. Another communist a spy in the Harbin community seized from his kin. The Japanese paid good money for these live detainees. The men of the RRP didn't care what their masters wanted the prisoners for, only that the money was good. Every disappeared Bolshevik trash meant more guns, more weapons, everything for the National Revolution. Petlin's uniform was crisp. Proper. He savored the occasion, the moment, the instant where hope of escape died in each prisoner's eyes. Some resisted until the turnover to the Japanese, but most of the eventually gave him Empty eyes for human shells, afraid cowering, their lives in Petlin's hands. It felt good to be Rozhevsky's point man. He was judge and arbiter. He would find all that dissipated the Russian fat. No, he awoke, drenched in sweat. He had. He'd never gone and helped in the kidnappings. Only heard rumors. Only. Petlin sat on his bed again. Lydia was gone, probably to the restroom. Heart beating, memories of Hobbin fading and vivid in his mart, in his mind. He had known the RPs were thugs. Petlin had known what they were up to. He had done nothing, many, mainly out of apathy. He had believed back then that the Vaz could do nothing wrong. <clears throat> Petlin knew he shared in the guilt. He stood, shook his head. Perhaps he could not atone. Yet he had to try. Only, a past only half buried. The Wastes of Magadan, Mikhail Mikovsky, uh, stood overlooking a large map of Magadan and its central lens in the conference room that he and his top advisors often met him. He sighed, taking in the reality of the situation, while Magadan was a real town. Most of the territory he had to control was either depopulated or underdeveloped or both. It wasn't exactly ideal a uh, situation for a government that needed bodies and infrastructure as fast as possible. As a number of that needed bodies, uh, as the numbers of ministers filed in, all of them presumably having been briefed on the nature of the meeting, Mikovsky turned to them. It is well known tactful, tactful manner. He addressed his audience. It's clear that a current situ industrial situation is untenable. Continuing moving aside to show his ministers the map, we need to take action to ensure that we're not overwhelmed by our so southern rivals. It's no secret that they enjoyed Japan's material support. One minister. Goldsall spoke up. It'll take some work, of course, but I think uh, about the same thing. We're going to allow ourselves to be outcompeted by rivals. A few proposals can be drawn up, my boss. Industrialization, under the direct supervision of the government, attracting any potential foreign investment by any means necessary. Mikowski looked around the room, waiting for any comments before continuing. Good, please no, do. I don't plan on matching Rozhevsky and the Whites. I want to outstrip the, the air production. Test and nuts from the f most followed. Mikowski made his intentions clear. He wanted to turn Magadan into a city of industry. Not an easy task, certainly, for Magadan's earliest purpose was to stop off of the work camps and mines in the region, but at the boss side of best, it was probably the best. And every person in the room, Mikowski included, knew that if the boss wanted it, it would be done. Mikowski nodded gently before stating, well then, let's get to work. Well, we have a work cut out for us. Hopefully, God, I hope we win here. You know, oh, come on, please win, please win. An American visit. <clears throat> A boy arrived from Kamchatka, carrying an interesting passenger, an American tourist. People do not usually come to visit Russia from the outside, especially Americans. After all, no one likes visiting war-torn wastelands, especially the spread out and far rigid, frigid Far East. He probably won't even last a week without freezing to death unless we help him out somehow. We cannot let a na naive American die in the wilderness, so the least we can do is provide shelter for a few days. Perhaps Mikowski could even meet with him. Being an American, he could be useful for reaching the leadership of the U.S. We have always wanted a closer relationship with the Americans, so why not start now when we have one right here? Mikowski even believes he has connections to the CIA. What fortune! Besides, it would be a good way to show hospitality. The American ought to be impressed when he meets the true boss of the Russian, no matter what. It would make a good impression with this. With make it would make a good impression, which would help us stand out besides all the other warlords surrounding us. However, maybe it could be better and safer idea to just give him a general tour around Magadan. Letting him see the town will show him the true way of life in Russia better than any meeting with Mutkowski. Besides, the boss is a busy man who may not enjoy wasting his time with a potentially worthless American. So, should we give him a tour of a town, or should Mutkowski invite him, invite him for a drink? Uh, I think I read this one last time. Let's give him a tour. I think I did this, this one last time. I'll probably go play Magadan again sometime, so give him a tour. And then name a small change. I don't have anything else. The traitor barked, surrounded by the thugs from the Russian fascist party. Their uniforms brown against the setting, se setting sun, visible in the distance beyond the display windows. They had ransacked his shop. Trinkets lay on the ground. And what little the, ca uh, the cash they had scrounged up and rung, rung out of the trader's pockets lay on the ground, on the counter. The shop had seen better days, days a trader could remember with fondness and warmth. The union wasn't perfect, but at least they had not hired over overgrown children to boss people around in fascist uniforms. 
One of the little fascists, a scrawny man with a voice frozen in permanent hysteria, thumped on the counter, sending the new few coins onto it into tremors. To his face, his fellow thugs called him Vlad, the boss. Behind him, they ridiculed his height and his voice and whispered rumors of him knowing some important figures in the party's political wing. I know you got some more, he said. Come on, Baldwin. He replied with his hands folded together. For our old friendship, you don't want to have all your... I'll have all you've ever destroyed, do you? I'm a patient. I'm, I'm patient. But my friends here are not. I keep begging them, but they won't leave you alone. I beg you, fulfill their simple wishes and pay. Once you pay up, I'll have your back again. Bog didn't have anything else. Business had been slow since the fall of the Union, and chaos wasn't exactly great for commerce. He hung on to his shop with a kind, stubborn nostalgia, dreaming that the old times might return. He turned to his office and to address the tormentors. Wait a moment. Kneeling beneath his desk, he found his family safe and unlocked it. A gun in his way, light, late wife's jewelry. His hand inched towards a pistol, but he stopped mid-motion. Not today, not wise. He took his wedding ring and handed it to Vlad. I'm so glad, Vlad said, that you decided to relent. After all, you are one of our favorite customers. Till later, Vlad. Till later. Severian Farms. As a famous Chinese strategist once said, an army marches not on its feet, but on its stomach. The poor town of Magadan has always relied on outside imports during the time of the cursed union and empire to sustain its need for food, deprived of connections to other regions of the motherland. Most of its inhabitants have turned to coastal fishing to make do in the meantime. A secret wish spreads in their hearts, born out of hunger, for Russia to save them. The party of Mikowski with it shall heed their call. The officials will gather volunteers and conscripts to work in the fields of Siberia. The Far East is not fertile, but an effort from an honest Russian will, will be all it takes to create a miracle. We do not need storehouses to be filled with food overflowing, just enough to survive the harsh climate of Siberia and Peter people. When Russia rises again, all these will be forgotten like ashes in the wind. Try something else. With the founding of the Siberian factories and farms, the party of Magadan has established itself as a force capable of action and reform. Unfortunately, these actions have only had limited success so far. Um, as hard as it is for Matkovsky and his political clique to admit it, time will only tell us to the efficacy of these efforts. For now, we can only wait. In the meantime, there's a matter of the armed forces of the party. Though capable and relatively well armed, our men are not suited for or are used to fighting the far north. Let's try to time to try something else. Matkovsky, a soldier himself in an age long past, shall observe as his generals and officers forge this from the soldiers a new army of hardened and experienced men capable of fighting in the tumultuous weather of Siberia. Drills will be regular occurrence. Weather in harsh or clear conditions, every soldier of Magadan shall be the spirit of Matkovsky's crusade. I really hope we come in here. We should be able to, but still. <clears throat> Entry to touring Magadan. I was given a tour around Magadan today. It's a fun town with a lot of bars. The only that served vodka, though, and to be honest, it's still pretty terrible. The seaport was probably the only big thing around, so there's a co very cozy feeling about the place. A weird sort of cozy, because you can walk past the family enjoying a quaint meal and then look across the street and see a black shirt officer beating up a hobo. So cozy, though. It's quite cozy. It feels like Magadan's the only place around, even though I'm told there are a few more villages nearby. Still, it's certainly isolated, so I can only... So I hope I can find my way to where I'm going next. There aren't many roads in Russia either. While we were touring, I'm pretty certain I also saw a labor camp. I'm not sure if it was what it was, but from what, from the way my tour guide tried to keep me away from it, I'm pretty sure Magadan has a few populated labor camps. Hopefully these will be the worst thing I see in Russia, from what I expect, however. Some places might be far worse. <clears throat> Overall, Magadan isn't all that bad. I do sure hope that not all places are like this, though. It seems like the people have adjusted to the harsh life here. Some in different ways than others, but I'm glad I came. It's time to continue my trip, and I have a long way to go. Still better than a mirror. Hmm. So you must have started in a mirror then, which is cool. Cool, cool, cool. Come on, win, boys, win. This might help you out. There you go. Nice. Now that definitely helped him out. If you want to be about ready successful, please go ahead. Ah, mask. Katarina saw her father sit down at the entrance of the house, oblivious to her presence. She found him clutching his temples as if a hair-splitting headache was tearing him apart. It wasn't the first time she noticed that her father tended to linger outside for a bit before entering her house. Now the sun was setting, its orange light aged his features beyond the man's already formidable years. He had joined the party since his first dates in Hopin and was a veteran of the anti-Bolshevik front. People from inside the party, further up. In the hierarchy, call their father Vlad the Tall, and a mockery of his height. Outside the party, they called him a thug, a criminal, a robber vested with an RFP uniform. Sometimes he could see his reputation manifest itself when he met his neighbors. Small business owners, shopkeepers, and the fishermen of the port looked at him with a mix of fear, reprehension, and disgust. Any time they dared cross uh, Vlad's path, however, they scurried away almost immediately when he drew his gun, a trusty nabu he kept by his side for years again since the days of Habim. <clears throat> and Katarina's eyes, however, she not find a monster in the figure of her father. Standing as a single silhouette against a dying day, he felt uh, his mask lapse and vanish every time he spoke a word to her. The icy and reserved, aloof, harsh, and cold attitude melted, revealing beneath him, if not a decent man, a husk of one. She ran out the door and caught her father's hand, surprising him. It's dinner time, she said, a smile across her face, and words, Get in! An image of a man painted in different shades. Was it Yakutia? Oh, it's basically the same place. Honestly, our guys are already here. Let's see what happens. There we go, see? Ah, we're gonna get that. Oh, I'm fine with this, yeah. Looking pretty good. Try something else. 
Acquired visors, preliminary, uh, preliminary army. The time has come for the Siberian factories we built to bear fruit. With enough workers to staff their floors and sufficient machinery, they can begin to operate as intended. From the streets of Magadan, these factory streamers can be seen churning out smoke. <clears throat> and to things they can create with him. Uh, rifles, uniforms, bullets, even artillery guns and shells look inside of them. The party is triumphed again in the most desperate situations Makovsky is pleased. It's time to arm the militant wing of the party. With adequate equipment, our soldiers will stand to fight the Red, Sars, or Nerzhevsky with much greater strength, even if it's a mistake to understand underestimate them so early. This advantage will afford us the opportunity we need to unify the Far East as Makovsky gears up for a crusade to liberate the motherland from the clutches of suffering and disunity. <clears throat> and scavenge for some good old loot. Andre? Oh, adaptable. Yes, yes, please. Yes, 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 yes. Inspection day. <laughs> Mikhail Mikowski, the boss himself, uh, made his way down to the Magadan garrison and expect the quality of troops that made up his army. The chilly morning air seemed not to have any effect on the boss, who was in full military dress. He, as he and his high command approached the troops in formation, all the soldiers were dressed as he was and sported their weapons of war. But even before he approached, Mikowski could tell what poor soldiers they would make. His generals exchanged nervous glances with one another. One soldier was too fat, the other malnourished. The third was too short, and the fourth didn't have his uniform buttons done upright. They all had the full uniform, but it seems as if they had simply had borrowed bits and pieces from the peers, and as a lot of them didn't fit. All of them, not just these four, were equipped with weapons that looked like they had just been outdated by the time the Germans were ravaging the west of Russia. The sorry state of affairs made it blatantly obvious to Mikowski that on one of the most important days of their lives, the troops could barely muster together even the smallest shred of professionalism. The inspection ended, Mikowski politely walking along the columns of the Malgadon garrison, taking mental notes, scruffy beards, outdated weapons, ill-discipline. Mikowski knew that it wasn't their fault for the most part. He had a chronic shortage of bodies, weapons, and officers, all of which were necessary for raising and maintaining a professional army. After the inspection, he called a meeting that was high command, who, where a rare flare of anger shone through his usual professional behavior. What's going on? These are the best troops you have to offer me? He asked his generals. A number of cursory, uh, cursory excuses were offered, but Mikowski put his hand up to demand their silence. I don't want to hear it. And these are the men who guard the capital. What what do those on the front lines look like? How do you think we will overcome the Jeskis, let alone retake the entirety of Russia? I don't care what the solution is. I want you to find it, and I want it to be briefed on, this on it this time tomorrow. Oh, come on. It's not that bad. <clears throat> Winterized gear is not bad, but... This is better to do. Acquire advisors. The lands of Siberia have a long history. From even before the time of the empire's rapid expansion eastwards in the past centuries, Mag uh, various people have dwelt here, and during the harsh weather and making a living from it. The troops of Magadan have learned much to learn from them, and their advice on surviving in the wild can mean the difference between life and death in the unrelenting conditions of the Far East. To acquire these advisors, some troops, along with the local interpreters, will travel north to the lands surrounding Kamchatka. There we will establish contacts with the natives, in hopes of using their millennia of experience to aid the development of their own theory of warfare. We shall mold our soldiers into survivors, into victors. No longer shall they survive in the Siberian wilds by the skin of their teeth. From now on, they shall live with neither doubt nor concern, given to the gods of the far eastern lands. Oh, yes, please. <clears throat> Radical techniques. The Far East is a wild, wild land, sparsely inhabited even during the Union Empire, without the civilization to sustain the Russian expansion east. Life has become challenging and unrelenting, and the forests and tundras of Siberia. War does not assume the character it has for the West, with no significant infrastructure to speak of. Warfare in the North has been reduced to skirmishes between little powers that battle for the control of the Far East. To come out on top in Siberia would mean abandoning the general precepts of war as it was taught in Europe. <clears throat> for the sake of our cause, we must leave behind everything we know. After all, the methods of war change to fit the ages. Soldiers, our soldiers will receive a radical new training regimen based on the lessons we've learned from the Siberian natives. Soon the forests and tundras of Siberia will be like the plains and fields of Western Russia to us, with no obstacle to stop us from attacking the enemy, whether it be Rozhevsky, Tsars, or even the Reds. <clears throat> Lonely Nights On the surface, Sergei Dmitri Dmitrievich Solyoev was not a dangerous man to the RFP. His printing press followed all the party's guidelines and regulations, and he lent them his business from time to time to print propaganda. However, on nights like these, with the moon nowhere in sight and accompanied by a sm single oil lamp, he lets the sod drop. He unscrewed his flask and drank some terrible vodka he had saved from the local distillery. Wretched stuff, but there was nothing better. The party took the cream of the crop for themselves. He returned to his desk. His figure throwing shadows in all directions. Sergei was in his office, in his element. He considered lighting up a cigarette while he worked, but decided against it. Sitting down, he glanced at the pamphlets he had written. Sa satisfied at his work, soon the garbage collection detail would come and collect his pieces, distributing them among the streets of Magadan. He paid them a small sum to keep quiet about it. Leaning down, Sergei almost dozed off before a thought knocked on his skull. Why did he do this? Resistance to the party was minuscule, and his men were more lo loyal to his money than anything else he could offer. He looked at his oil lamp. It was fuel running low, a single candlelight holding out against a backdrop of darkness. The symbolism was not lost on Sergei. Perhaps in a few days, in a few weeks, and maybe even a year, he'd find himself in a basement, moments away from being snuffed out. He put aside his worries. As knock sounded, Sergei stood to answer it. Embers of a past age. Nice. Yuri Dragomirov. Pyotr Lazarev, uh, Larazev, Grigory Ivanov, and Lazarev. Great, you're not enough. Cool. Amur. Uh, we'll do you guys next. It's fine. It's very tiny. Very small. Winterized gear, though, my friends. 
Among all the ways that the white far east can be in inhospitable, the most prominent is that it's low temperature. To move in the cold Siberian winter is hard, to fight in it is even harder. Worse, the gear that a soldier is currently used often decays or is otherwise useless in the harsh weather. We must find a solution as the winter conditions are near constant concern for our troops. Moreover, acquiring more durable equipment for the Siberian winter will give our soldiers another crucial advantage against our enemies. Mikowski will order all military equipment to be winterized. As most of our equipment is not ready to be used in low temperatures, this will still be a lengthy and involved process. However, this is a struggle we must endure. The eventual liberation of Russia will take everything we have, and this small inconvenience is nothing compared to that of challenge. Someday, when Mikowski rules Russia, all this will prove its worth. Trading Faces Hey, it's you! Tom turned to meet the eager Russian, whose slurred speech and broken English could most likely be attributed to the bottle he clutched. The frankness of the drunkard reminded him of back home. It was an amusing end to a long day. Oh, you got it wrong, pal, he started to say. Oh, don't work to make merry with me, American. You're John, his brow furrowed, unable to conjure a full name. The famous hero in the cowboy hat. Come with me. An arm slinked around Tom's shoulder. The pair began to walk towards the city center. Tom thought for a moment, glancing over his shoulder back towards his crew and the sad, cold doctor they inhabited. <clears throat> for a split second, he prepared to shake the man off, then his posture relaxed and his resistance stopped. Why not be John Wayne for a moment? The two men eventually reached Taba, and the Thomas trembled as newfound comrade Alexander clicked open the door violently. Uh, Brothers, look at the American who's decided to come smuggling in a port. The one from the movies. The blank faces stared back at the unfolding spectacle. Seemingly annoyed at his disruption, Tom grinned, mustering a half ham fisted southern drawl. Well, howdy, folks. The room erupted into jovial cheers and laughter. Many, having been drunk into a stupor themselves, indulged the fantasy. Others simply indulged in a good time. Tom was one such man, playing his part and chatting between beers for good of the night. For much of the night. Today had been a good day after all. A warm night in a cold, cold place. Awesome. Setting out the winter. We've done all we can. The factories and farms stand. The produce finding the way to the soldiers and citizens alike. Native advisors capable of... <clears throat> oh. I have trained our men into hardened soldiers capable of surviving the inhospitable Far Eastern climate while maintaining combat effectiveness. The winterization order is complete. The equipment churned out by our manufacturers are now capable of performing in low temperatures. We are ready to act, but winter's coming. There's not much we can do against the forces of nature. We must set the winter out. <clears throat> and station the soldiers to perform maintenance on the telegram poles and roads. Patrols will still happen to ensure that Mikowski's domain will remain free of crime and banditry, but no combat exercise will take place. All units will operate as usual, adjusting for weather. When it ends, there's an enormous task that awaits us all, and Mikowski shall stand ready at the helm. Cool, we got both done. Let's keep going with this stuff, and let's get some uh, artillery. Uh, I guess we might as well. Behind the scenes. The crowd was rejoicing in rear sight in Russia. Their cinemas didn't have even have levels for the seats. And the people below had to compete and shove others out of the way for a glimpse of the silver screen. Thomas sat in the projection booth, nursing a bottle of vodka personally given by the boss, who was sitting at the front. He took a sip, expecting the bitter flavor to overwhelm him. Instead, it felt light. Taste of dirt. Horrible. He put it down, setting it behind his ankles. Thomas stared at the image, a blurry mass of green blobs charging black dots on the screen. Today's movie was an adaptation of a famous American comic book, Captain America, for Thomas, a connoisseur supreme of the movie industry. This film was trash. Its projection and audio were even worse than the script. He found out too late that the lenses didn't fit, and to prop it in with some tape. The result was a screen infested with a permanent blur, and the crackling, scarce, and incomplete audio made the viewing experience into something fantastical. Mikhail Mikowski, the vase of all the Russians, he, as he sat himself, sat at the front. A charismatic, almost intimidating man. It was almost comical to see him laughing at what Americans would think was garbage. Intelligence, it seemed, did not uplift taste. The hero charged at the enemy, and the brown blots collapsed and tumbled backwards. The crowd cheered, and the air was out of the discordant revelry. Thomas leaned down to pick up his bottle of vodka, only to send it tumbling and spilling all over the floor. He sighed. It's going to be a long night. <clears throat> the present of the Tsar. Huh. The Vaz, huh? Sitting. Oh, Desperate Times? Not that one yet. Sitting out the weather. Desperate Times. After all we've done, it's come to this. Our food supplies are running out, our winterized equipment barely works in the winter winds, and our farms and factories are non-functional. The winter might have come and gone, but has left its mark on our efforts to stabilize the realm and gain traction amid the harsh, severe conditions. Perhaps it was time to look outwards, using Mikowski's plans to reach out to the foreign powers and emigrate to support his cause in Russia. We have three options that we can go through. The Tsar, reciting a cheetah, is our unwilling enemy at best, but perhaps we can convince his clique to accept a ceasefire. The Americans, under their President Nixon, may be inclined to support us, provided we make them promises of reform. Finally, the Russian emigrates, the most prominent of whom is an influential fascist and fantastic. Vasin Vansetsky might be persuaded through, through the resources behind a cause, regardless of whom we convince to support us. One thing is clear, the party will not survive alone. And that's from Yakutia, huh? There we go. Nice. Scam for loot. You might as well. She'll be able to win here. Honestly, I don't remember exactly the last time uh, last group I played here or which way we went down. For the Vaz. Ah, Magadan Free Radio Broadcast 1. <clears throat> The rare broadcast started wrong. Before the talk show began, the Magadan Free Radio played a sequence of songs plagued by crackling audio. The inexperienced crews of the MRF, a fascist unused to any other work than thuggery, had mixed the sound with too much bass and mistakenly placed the trouble dial. Uh, the audio cuts. A thump. Two thumps. Is this thing on? Of course, the voice said, his lips smacking too close to the microphone. Oh, it is! 
Another voice, a smooth baritone, said from the far corner of the room, We're alive. What the heck are you saying? Trembling on the table as the voice closed in, three taps on the table. Follow the script, an awkward pause. Did you forget to disconnect the microphone? Did you... That's such a disaster. An electric discharge sound as if the mic, mic was unplugged. The badly mastered songs continued rattling the first broadcast of the MFR. The audio cuts out again. The chorus uh, voice returned. Still a little too close to the mic. Hello, fellow Russians in the Far East. Welcome to the very first radio broadcast of Magadan Free Radio. Lip smacking. My name is Sergey. I'm a host of the radio tonight. Alongside with my friend Vasily, Sergey's voice showed off a few moments later. He shouted in the mic, likely blowing out a few eardrums. Vasily! <laughs> Vasily took to his seat. Audibly, with a little sigh, began, Yes, with my friend Sergei here, we shall accompany you through many, many cold nights uh, in the future. An affected cheer. For now, we'd like to thank Mr. Mikowski, the Vaza, the RFP, for sponsoring this program. <clears throat> An awkward silence as the clocks ticked uh, in the background. Now, let's just proceed with the music. Just before the audio turned on again, the smooth baritone said, What the F is wrong with you? Cool. What a way to, way to make a first impression. Promise to reform. Operation interlude. Ooh. The Tsar. Smuggling routes. Put aside our differences. Divide and conquer. Now, I'll be honest, I don't know which way we're, we're, we're going to go down, but I'll be just back and to show you which way we're going to go. All right, everyone. So, um, I didn't realize this, but for the focus sheet, we're doing the president. We can do all three of these, which I think I said last time too, but I forgot about this. But the president, to our greatest possible supporter, <clears throat> we must look across the vast Pacific Ocean and set our eyes on the super superpower of the Western Hemisphere, the U.S. of A. They are one of the most powerful nations in the world and possess almost unparalleled industrial and military might. Matkovsky has set his eyes on getting at least a small fraction of that might to support his quest and reclaim Russia. President Nixon is the nation's current leader, and so far has not shown much willingness to involve them in America in Russian affairs, something we need to change. There are two requirements to gain American support. The first is to prove our regime that can be useful and a reliable asset. The second is to show that we are different from the fascists they hate. Achieving both will be crucial we want to overseas, uh, or want overseas A to arrive, in which we're going to spend all, pretty much all of our political power trying to get as much stuff here Artillery, motorized, infantry equipment, blueprints, and even tanks. Like, we, I want some tanks and planes, so. We're, I don't remember if we're going to lose support from doing that stuff, but it is what it is. And let's kill these guys off if we possibly can. The Siberian Bill of Rights. A big obstacle preventing us from receiving support from the across the Pacific is our ideology. As the American government is under the impression that we are too, an oppressive and totalitarian regime, like the ones we're struggling to fight against, to portray ourselves in a positive light, perhaps it's time to begin making reforms, or at least appear to be making them. And a good start is a guarantee on the rights of our citizens. A formal document will be drafted and signed by Mikhail Mikovsky, guaranteeing basic rights such as equal treatment, freedom of expression, and freedom of assembly to all people, ethnic Russians or not, regardless of whether we follow through this law to the letter. It'll be a sign that we are eager to reform and we're not the same as the German Nazis, something the USA definitely cares about. And a promise to reform. Now that we've stated our intent to ensure freedom for our own citizens, it's time to appeal to the USA directly. Instead of beating around the bush, an address made by our boss in the front of the citizens of Magadan and directed at the White House, he will state that the regime, even though it was born out of the RFP, is open to reform and will not fight against it, but embrace it instead. The hope is that this great call for reform will reach the ears of the congressman and even the president himself, and will finally change their minds regarding the issue of Russia and how to best approach it. And increase the support by a little bit, because I want to get a lot of public meetings and get more political power. Like, that's what we're here for. Uh, yes. And, uh... Huh, workers, I guess. The man in the White House. Nikolai Petlin adjusted his tie, a mental tick. Uh, something he leaned or learned a long time ago in the RFP. Looking over his desk, he ruminated on the task Mikovsky had assigned to him. A typewriter surrounded by rolls and rolls of ink, practically a luxury. Petlin could not imagine writing those letters and appeals by hand. He spent long hours in this office, and his fingers twitched as he prepared himself to type again. His assistants could only do so much. None spoke English, and to ask Mikovsky for a would overstep propriety. He sighed. He remembered the words Mikovsky told him. Convince the man in the White House, his master had said, staring into Petlin's eyes without flinching, that's all. Mikovsky did not like being taken lightly. At the best of times, Petlin could see the old Hobbin spirit in him, a spirit of hope, of kindling, of a prayer for a new home. The winter had extracted its toll upon the man, and the gaunt, flushed cheeks were but symptoms of a payment. He looked beneath his feet, stacks upon stacks of paper, numbering almost another thousand soon upon the completion of his task. These would be sent to America, finding themselves in the mailboxes of senators, representatives, Russian emigres, and other sort of people who were receptive to Mikovsky's project. On top of the further stack lay a folder, bound in manila yellow, plastered the front, it was a label that read, The My Siberian Bill of Rights. The document contained uh, Petlin's personal ideas to solicit more aid, or at least sympathy, for the Americans. He wondered if Mikowski knew what his real sympathies were. He shook his head. Now was not the time for the mind to wander. He laid his fingers upon the keyboard of the typewriter, and the clacking began. Let's hope, of course, that this does work. Waiting American support, their refuse tribute. Sounds good to us. And let's go in and beat up some more horses. I'm sorry to the horses. I promised reform, which is good to do. I'll get more political power this way and stability. Every successful sees all we can use. Yay! Purchase American guns? Heck yeah! Because we are 
Out of guns. The Siberian Bill of Rights. This is far too liberal, Petlin, Mikowski said, holding back his anger. It seems almost socialist to me. He put it to set the files down and pressed his index finger against it. It's not acceptable. It was inconceivable that you would present this to me in the first place. How could you do this, Petlin? The man he considered to be almost a brother to himself, and his own foreign minister. He stared into Petlin's eyes, finding fear and obedience setting their weight into his psyche. Maybe this was not intentional after all. Sir, if I may explain myself, Petlin said, freezing his hand before he could correct his tie. The Americans are different from us. We need to... I get your point, Petlin. It's just, Mikowski said, waving off him. There's not what I... Not we stand for. When I read your document, I found phrases like the right to assembly, right to free speech. These dangerous ideas not fit for Russia. The rebellious intent practically jumps off the pages, Mikowski sighed. Just what the heck were you thinking about, brother? Petlin gathered himself and stood together. Straighter. Sir, if I may insist, my ideas can still be useful. Not only in convincing the Americans, but the Russians as well. He cracked his knuckles in anxiety. I have faith in the strength of ideals and convictions, sir, I do. I beg you not to mistake any com competence as rebelliousness. Mikowski felt a rare moment of generosity, stretching his arms wide. Petlin, Petlin, he said. Tapping his foreign minister on the shoulders, I would never. You've been with us since the beginning, but closer to me than ever, my, than even my chancellor. He whispered to Petlin, now, help me with all these. I am afraid that your brother lacks the skill necessary to convince the Americans. Yes, Petlin said, his voice trembling. I, I'll do as you say. Good, now cut back. We can't afford all of this. Make holes and loopholes. Make holes and loop them. Dismiss. Petlin left the room in a great hurry. Sacrifices have to be made, but Operation Intrude? Uh, intrude? Eh, that might be okay. Yeah, I might as well finish this out first. The part of Magadan is still one of the biggest Russian naval facilities, still not occupied by foreign enemies. Whether weather permits, as ships, Russians or not, regularly make stops for numerous reasons. However, the port can also have one more use. To become a receiver of American equipment and supplies, thus our leader Mikowski has devised a plan to make an offer the USA will not refuse. Magadan is quite close to the Japanese Hope Islands that are just across the Okhotsk Sea, and a radar station here will give our future allies the opportunity to spy on their sworn enemies from a closer distance. Perhaps this will make them understand the benefits we can offer, and they will decide to help us. Well, let's hope so. And let's do the Tsar, welcoming wearable. We do get some more stability, which I like, and some army XP, which is pretty nice too. Even though I would love the equipment, but the Vaz. Anatasy Andreevich Vansiatsky, or as it prefers to be known, the Vaz of all the Russians, as the leader of the fascist emigres in America. Once a close partner of the Russian fascist party, Rozhevsky's pro German rhetoric drove him away. Leading his own political organization of the white Russian emigres, the RFO, he has garnered a significant support from Russian refugees currently residing in the U.S. Now that we split from Rozhevsky, perhaps Vansiatsky would reconsider support for the Russian fascist party. Having the backing of the foreign based RFO would give us a source of income untouched by the bandit raids of Rozhevsky or others, along with this new stream of income. There are rumors that he is one of the most dangerous men in America, a former OSS operative named Mitchell Werbel III. If there's a chance that Vaz can put us in touch with him, we must reach out immediately. God bless Uncle Sam. Mason felt nervous, even though he was an American agent, trained in both formal and spoken Russian. He had never conversed in any depth with the soldiers, much less giving instruction and introducing or introduction to American weapons. He smirked. There was an irony to it all, despite having been schooled and educated in one of the most renowned countries on earth. Mason was out of his depth as the illiterate Russian fascist standing before him. The cold, chilly air of the early morning gave his percussive heartbeat a tinge of anxiety and excitement in his veins. The training fields were empty save for a few animals scurrying underfoot. An officer prep Mason. From the honorable nation of America he goes, Mason has come. A bunch of feel-good bromides and legalese, but he guessed that the soldiers needed to respect him before first, before they would be willing to listen to him. He caught a few of them saying the equipment he brought here, or eyeing the equipment. Mason didn't think it was all that impressive, considering the things he had seen while working in the agency, but again, cultural and technological differences. After a few hours long and anxiety-ridden minutes, it was finally his turn to speak. He drew back his tongue and lashed it out, throwing the dust off the language he seldom used. Hello, he said. As the officer has said, my name is Mason. He grabbed an M1 Garand and held it against his shoulders. This is the Garand. You, he pointed to the random soldier in the crowd. Fire your weapon. See how fast you can do it. He pointed it to a target in the distance. The soldier had to eject the casing every time he fired. Sometimes he resorted to hitting his rifle with his wrist before it worked. Now watch this. He aimed the Garand and fired eight shots in succession. His streak stopped by the ping of the gun. He laid the rifle beside him with its butt on the ground. And that is the American firepower, he said to the uh, odd fascists. Any questions? No questions yet. But I'm sure they'll have some. Welcoming Warble. <laughs> the son of a Tsar's officer in the White Armies, Mitchell Warble III became an OSS operative during the Great Patriotic War. Among the theaters he served in were in were then British Burma and former French, French into China. After the war decisively ended in Japan's favor, he returned to America to work as a, a mundane job before deciding that combat was his calling. Since then, he has served in many conflicts the world over, earning him the fearsome nickname the Wizard of Whis Whispering Death. Mikowski has decided that it would be in the party's best interest to welcome this character of a man into our ranks. Along with him will come his entourage, a collection of mercenaries who have long fought across the world and are looking to fulfill any need for wet work. We will welcome him and his crew to the port town of Magadan. Once there, we will have his work cut out for him. Or they will have his work cut out for him. They shall find that there's what work to do in their heart's content. Or to their heart's content. Keep improving relations. And scam truly. The Count of Fascism. Zarova. Brother Metkovsky. The man hailed from the piers of the harbor. A lean body and pale face with a hand stretching out 
in the early morning year, waving to Metkovsky. Anastasia Ivansiatsky, also known as the Count of the Russian Fascism, had set foot on the port of Magadan. He showed forward his steps, eager in his guide quick, and patient to meet his so-called equal in the old world, covering his nose once he discovered the smaller docks. He looked small, pathetic against the backdrop of wooden fishing ships about to depart into the morning light. Mitkowski furrowed his eyebrows. No one in this world currently has the right to address him in such a way, giving an awkward, pained smile towards Vosniatsky. He and his bodyguards walked forward to meet this count. Extending his hand in a gesture of hospitality, Mitkowski said, Zeravtsutsie, how has America treated you? Vonsiatsky wasted no breath in clasping Metkovsky's open palms. Great brother! He leaned forward, planning to catch Metkovsky in a hug. Metkovsky relented. America must have changed Vonsiatsky. The intimate gestures, the over-enthusiastic, unreserved spirit in that greeting. It was all a bit much, coming from a fellow Russian, still drunk in that spirit. <clears throat> Vonsiatsky said aloud, uh, 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 It is the land of the free, all this, he gestured with his hand, is too small for us. You seem to forget the reason you were here, brother, Metkovsky said, a hint of coldness in his voice. No, 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 no. He dipped his hands in his pockets. This man... As a gift from me to you, he showed Mikovsky a black and white photograph of an American in Bray. Tell me more, old money. The Russian fascist organization, Vonsiatsky's fascist political group, is home to some of the wealthiest donors within the Russian emigrant community, now that we have his backing. It's time to turn the funds they've provided to a higher cause than parties and gatherings, and a land that will never be their home. The sons and daughters of Russia and America should no longer find their money squandered by party functionaries for frivolous things now they support a real movement. The RFO should change their money f challenge their money from America and across the Bering Strait in the form of hard currency or even equipment, whether it be war or industry related. These funds and supplies will help us immensely in the coming conflict against the splendors in the red soon. We shall prepare for these estranged siblings of ours to return to a Russia they have known since their childhoods. A strong, capable Russia, one without equal in this world, the wizard of the whispering death. A light curtain have drizzled had descended upon the port of Magadan. The crowds adorn their bodies with a great steely gray, and the waters of the harbor tugged and pushed their way inland, their courses halted by the low lying sea walls. Amid the piers, rows upon rows of wooden fishing ships lay steady, their hulls quivering in the fierce wind, shallow rain, and rusted waves. There was one vessel that stood out among the others, a metal desk, with rust coating its bow. The tumultuous air did not even seem to flinch it. Matkovsky, <clears throat> following an aide bearing an umbrella to shield him from the downpour, walked forward with a strange vessel. If Onsiatsky had been speaking the truth, there was, an, there was no question to the owner of the ship. Mitchell Werbel, legendary mercenary, the veteran of a thousand uh, <clears throat> wars worldwide, an infamous soldier of the fortune, the wis wizard of whispering death, Matkovsky steeled himself to meet this legend of a man before seeing a figure stumbling out of the ship, staggering towards him. Mikoski blinked. There was no mistaking it. The figure was Werbel, looking more green in the photographs than Mikoski had seen of him, a beret hanging precariously to a scalp. Mikoski tightened his pace, striding forward at such a pace that his aide had difficulty in following him. When he came face to face with Werbel, the man tried to give a clumsy smile, only for it to be mistaken for contempt. Welcome, Mikoski said in English. We've been expecting you, Mr. Werbel. Privet, Werbel said. My tovarich. Tovarich. He continued in Russian, mixing it with English words when he had no clue what words to use. Mikoski, for his part, tried to dissuade him from uh, uh, bastardizing the Russian language, and occasionally a word or two made it through Orbel's manners. But he was inconsolable. With uh, what little correct Russian he spoke was sprinkled with generous helpings of effing and crap. Blushing furiously in anger and embarrassment, Mikoski finally extended his hand. Here's, Mikoski said, trying to keep his smile in place. To start of a beautiful relationship, uh, uh, friendship, not relationship, friendship. Orbel clasped his hand with neither doubt nor comprehension. Da! Tovarish. Nice. And integrate the mercs. The mercenaries of that world were brought in are leagues ahead of our current soldiers. How could they not be? After fighting the wars in the world over, they're perhaps the most elite force in the Far East, surpassing even the Red Army remnants that the Reds have. They've proven themselves to be a capable asset of Mikoski so far, and although their loyalty is only as strong as their pay, they may be well worth the money. However, due to their independent nature, these mercenaries have been functioning outside the command structure, only taking orders from the commanders, and are generally uncooperative except for the direct orders from Mikoski himself. This practice must end. We will integrate the mercenaries into a rank and file. Having better skills does not mean that one is exempt from subordination to a superior. Cooperation with a mercenary like Werbel might be distasteful for some Russians, but the, the day that Russia can stand on its own is still in the distance. Rising tensions. It all started with a game of cards in a bar. Alexei's joint, just down the street, from the port of Magadan. There are a couple of locals, their names blurring on this party report sheet, were playing blackjack. The gamble is over, a couple of drinks and several hundred rubles, but nothing big, but nothing small. They expected the night to go on as smoothly as it always did, cruise into the moonlight as the games continued, pockets emptying and men falling into the streets with the grace of a drunken feet. Three listless men entered into the bar, new rivals of Magadan. They were Werbel's men, heavily armed and heartily paid. Professional soldiers that hail, hail, hail from all corners of the world. They had too much free time, and at first they and the locals got along quite well, which was to say they did not interact much at all. Only silent nods and scarce eye contact bridged the difference between the groups. <clears throat> The uneasy truce did not last long. 
The listless man flirted with the girls behind the counter, and the locals did not like it, setting up the shout of profanities at the mercenaries in a language they did not understand. It did not take long for the soldiers to unholster the pistols and threaten the locals. It only took a minute before one of the mercenaries accidentally fired a shot, resulting in a dead civilian who was only found hours later after the rioting had assured. The locals, instead of bringing, being driven back by gunshots, charged our men, using broken bottles and chairs to attack the new rivals. The rebels and mercenaries, dispatched as a backup of the new rivals, got involved shortly. The party's police, who intervened to stop more bloodshed, were met with a rain of bullets and jagged glass after a dozen dead civilians. Oh, great. Um, and two dozen more wounded. The riots were finally put down by force. The three mercenaries were immediately tried under sentence. The party's police, for the part, did their jobs after two hours. A premonition, perhaps? Yes. Probably a really bad premonition. As we try to integrate them. Thank you for paying your tribute. Very good. Thank you. Ah! A division! Yes, yes. Another division is great to have. The Tsar. Just barely separated from her territory by the vile force of Rajeski, Chita has more in common with us than most of our other warlord states. An evolution of the diverse emigre movements and organizations that appear in Habim. This regime is based itself not on fascism, but Tsarism. The group of white generals behind Chita's foundation approached Mikhail Andrevich, a descendant of the Romanovs, yet one with little legitimacy as a contender for the throne, and took a part of Yogoda's empire as a collapse. We share a lot of common in both our ideologies and our enemies, and Mikhail seems eager to cooperate and forge close relationships for now. It might be difficult due to the lack of an overland connection, but that will not stop us from making contact with our new friends in Cheeto. The White Mouse. <clears throat> Warbowl checked his uh, uh, watch. 20 seconds to 10 p.m. Uh, Siberian time. He had his radio laid out in front of him, ready to transmit. Before the communication could proceed, however, he ordered all of his men out of the room, preferring to be alone. While the matter was not confidential, he wanted to keep everything private. Tonight was a special night. A time to talk with an old friend, so long as she also held to her schedule, that is. Ten seconds out. Werbel rubbed his hands against his temples. The Siberian business was hard, and Mikoski was proving himself to be no pushover. Werbel smirked. The darn dude would have his due. Fingers on the dial. Two seconds out. When it reached ten o'clock, his hand, right hand snapped. Find the frequency that she used. Locking onto it without difficulty. <clears throat> oh, look at this. <clears throat> he reached for the microphone and spoke at it. White Mouse, he said, waiting expectantly for a reply. Are you there? You're late, kindly. A maternal voice replied. Maybe age has slowed you down a bit after all. She laughed. Robo smiled on the other side of the White House. White Mouse. One of the Brits who had the backbone of fighting a war and be good at it. And a comrade during all those times where the Americans lost the torch of liberty before falling down a set of stairs to disgrace. Good to see you, wizard. He saw her firm, proud smile beyond the radio waves. Likewise, Mouse, Robo said, kicking it back in his seat, his microphone standing precariously on his chest. How oh, is Kamchatka? Is it a crap hole, too? Likewise, Mouse, Robo said. Ooh, oh, my bad. He felt her frowning at him. Language, wizard, he said, sighing. But yes, there's not much to do around here. Still looking up to Uncle Sam? You know what she said. I know you've gone in India and all, but the OS, no, the CIA, has a proposition for you. Forget it, he said, fuming. Make no mistake, he liked Nixon. Only a good American could bring America back together. And not those cowardly liberals with their talk of peace, land, and bread. Effing commies. He just couldn't let go. I still remember the last time I worked for those no-good bass. The white mouse hushed him. We have also taken your concerns to the mind. Or to mind. She spelled her plans off for him. His eyes widened. Heck of a plan, Werbel said, laughing. You made... You mad dudes. The shadow grows. We got quite a bit of army XP, but smuggling routes. The biggest problem with reaching a mutually beneficial relationship with the Tsar, Mikhail's state has been finding an answer to the question of how we should reach them. But we have developed a solution. It's well known fact that here in the Far East, the settlements and the links between the new between them are few and far between. This means that if we are careful and closely examine our pathways and schedules, it is actually possible to create a route, or even several of them, that will be able to connect us to Cheetah through secret means. These routes, guarded by our best men, will allow for a flow of weapons and resources that goes both ways, and even the transport of emissaries between our states. If we can smuggle anything we want to in from Cheetah, that is a good first step in overcoming geography and establishing good diplom diplomatic relations. I do apologize for speaking very quickly in this episode, but like I've read through most of this before, but I do want to get uh, read through all everything as well. <clears throat> Put aside our differences. We and the royalists of Cheetah have much in common, and yet we have many disagreements as well. We share a common background, but while they have traced the roots to the old ways of the Tsar's empire, our ideology stems from a new and fresh movement, that of Russian fascism, of course. It is the faith of the old Russian generals and politicians in the power of a monarch that separates us, but that does not make reconciliation impossible in this dire environment. To face a common enemy that is Rozhevsky's fascist party, we'll make a move showing our friendship and respect for Cheetah by proposing a pact of cooperation and non-aggression with them. If they accept, then we may even have a chance to strike it a mirror with more safety. The Pretender. To the Honorable Claimant, to the Throne of Russia, the letter read so far, We have come to beseech you for your aid against mutual enemy. The traitor Konstantin Rzeski, no, the letter ought not to be so direct. Putting down his pen, Matkowski laid his hand across his face and sighed, leaning his forearm against the table and propping his head against the open palm. He stared at the page, want, waiting to be filled with his writing. His tea sat right below him, its smell tempting him. Matkowski tapped his feet, he had no time for that now. <clears throat> 
For the first time in a long while, Mikowski found himself adjusting his glasses, his fingers wrapping the table in sequence. A thousand questions swarmed his mind. What if the Tsars rejected the treaty? What if they find the terms unacceptable? He shuddered to think of what would happen if both sides did not cooperate against Rajevsky. Someone knocked on the door. Rather than answering, Mikowski's index finger mimicked the rhythm on his table. Standing it from his seat, but he said aloud, The letter's not ready yet. Go away. The knocking stopped. He looked at the letter. Clapping his hands together and drawing his deep breath, he sat down, toying with a pen as he thought of what to say to Mikhail. We appeal to the name of our old friendship, as he scribbled without much thought. In the anti-Bolshevik front, as we all know, he found his hands picking up speed. Before long, he would stand and say, This letter's ready. Come on in. Uh, Hunter's view. Nikita strode into the town of Magadan, confidence vested, invested in every step of his gait. His rifle, which he had slung behind his back, providing a comfortable weight, an anchor that kept his livelihood going. In his arms, he carried a, the hide of a moose, a worthy prey whose coat will suit a gentleman of Hobbin snugly. Today, perhaps, Nikita could earn a bit more than he needed to survive for another week. Perhaps, maybe a pack of cigarettes, or even a can of powdered coffee. In his head, he toyed with the image of the vase wearing something made from his lovely hide of the moose. As usual, RFP officials and thugs guarded every entrance to the city, their brown uniforms contrasting with the pale buildings of the town, however. Nikita noticed that the RFP now had new companions among the ranks, sharply dressed men and women armed to the teeth and speaking a thousand foreign tongues. Concealing into a tower of Babel manifested into the outskirts of Russia. It was quite the sight with the mercenaries keeping to themselves and the Russians eternally suspicious of what was going on. The officials cleared him to enter the town, provided that he left his rifle in their checkpoint. He sold his hide for some good cash. Money he could use to buy bullets, provisions, food, and medical supplies to last him for another week. There was something new to the town, however, and American products. Or American products. American coffee, cigarettes, and even radios were available and quite common even. They were cheaper than native Magadan goods, although they were often sold out by the end of the day. Nikita brought a pack of cigarettes and a can of powdered coffee. Smiling at his newest gains, he strolled into the edge of town, returning to his home in the northern reaches of Siberia. Another good day's catch, and we're going to get some trucks. Because we're going to need them. We're going to need some mo motorized stuff. Nice smuggling routes. Put aside our differences. And divide and conquer. Since the days we split from the RFP hardliners, Rajevsky's forces and more have been the biggest threat for survival. No other frontier has been heavily guarded as our southern one, and it's not uncommon for the situation to escalate in raids and skirmishes by the border garrisons. Now that we've found Alice and Cheetah, we can make a show of force to demonstrate our power as well as test our capabilities as well. We'll find the perfect moment to strike, and when we do raid a larger, we'll do a raid larger than any we've launched will begin. The Tsars will help distract Rajevsky's army in the east, and will hopefully improve our position in the freezing lands of eastern Siberia. Another another division? Oh, great! The Treaty of Cooperation. Here's the treaty that Tsar sent us, Petlin said, setting the, the draft of the agreement on the table. Uh, sir. He almost adjusted his tie again before the stern stare of the vase stopped his left hand. Yet those eyes did not judge Petlin's mannerisms in any detail. They went up and down the document, examining its fine print, looking for chinks in the deal that the Tsars, or even the RFP for the matter, could exploit. No word on it seemed to raise any reactions from Minkowski, uh, beyond an occasional rise of eyebrows and a nod. Putting the document aside, Mikowski turned to address his foreign minister. Petlin, he said, chilling every bone in his minister's body. He gulped. It was a moment of truth where the Vols would deliver his final verdict. Good work, Mikowski said after a few moments. You exceeded my personal expectations. Before I signed this, he picked up his pen, toying with it. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Petlin drew a deep breath. No, he said. There's none. Mikowski's hand promptly drew a signature on the document. It is done. He dropped the pen and rose. Deliver this to representatives of the Tsarist and tell them that the Vols accepts the deal and death to Rajevsky. Standing in front of Petlin, he offered his hand. I appreciate that I at least have at least one competent person in charge of affairs around here. A smile, a rare thing for Mikowski to show. Petlin shook his hand. Yes, sir. I will do as you say. Your compliments are high praise for my blood on station, sir. Mikowski pat patted his shoulder. All in a day's work, Petlin turned and left where he came in from. Death to Rajevsky. I want to raid more people, ma'am. I want to raid more people. Our secure position. The Tsars and Cheetah have agreed to a temporary truce, and they're even willing to cooperate in a limited capacity. The Americans have been appeased by our promises to reform, together the Bill of Rights promulgated in Magadan and sent to American agencies from overseas. The support from emigres has become ours, as von Tsiatsky has designed a dying to join us in the crusade to liberate our sacred homeland. Our position is now firm and secure. It is now time to solidify these advantages as Mikowski's ideas take root in the Far East. Before the party of Magadan proceeds to its holy task, perhaps it's time to stop and let the results of these treaties simmer for a while. Let the funds overseas flow into the coffers of the party, with American support ensuring steady gains. The limited cooperation with the Tsars and Cheetah will continue as we raid Rajevsky's followers. From both sides, soon Mikowski will use all that he has gained for the next step. A Siberian army. Loot, baby, loot. Death of hope. Vasily had arrived in Magadan, or lived in Magadan, for his entire life. In the time since the fall of the old Union, the town had seen many highs and many more lows. The lack of trade practically erased the local economy, and the pirates and smugglers... Oh, look at this. Oh. <coughs> erased the, uh, out of, the smugglers out of Kamchatka were the only freight leaving these, the city these days. Vasily had been the head of the Dock Workers Union before the RFP took over, and was only nearly spared the noose by de denigrating himself and denouncing the Union in front of his former friends. Now, he sat outside a local bar, puking his guts out after another long day of drinking, when it seemed that he could almost stand on his own. 
He tried to rise, but only managed to puke on the stranger's boots. He coughed an apology and readied himself for a beating that never came. The stranger helped him up and steadied himself before he could tip over. Here, drink, he heard before a canteen of water was thrust into his hands. Thanks, but about the booze, I'd offered again to replace, but while I spent my last rubble, rubble on the booze, I just spat out. The stranger flinched back as his breath hit him. The man took his canteen back before escorting Vasily back home. Everyone could call his shack on the outskirts of the city home. Sitting on the rusted bed, he saw the stranger sit on an old bar stool that he had lying around. The man peered at him a moment before showing him an old and worn photo. He recognized them, Vasily looked closely and realized he could. Yeah, that's old Aaron and his family. Look, kid, if you were you're looking for them, ain't no point. They were purged before the RFP split. All of them are dead now. I'm sorry. I see. Thank you. The stranger suddenly stood, uh, stood suddenly, and turned to leave, though not before a drop of stack of rubles on the stool. A final hope, of course, dashed. A Siberian army. The agreements that we have secured with the foreign powers, mercenaries, and the Tsars have brought us valuable time and given us room to breathe. Now the party can turn its eyes towards the chief means of its holy task, the army. Well, our uh, party is no pacifistic organization. Its militant wing is so far consists of Chinese and militia drawn upon from the streets and outskirts of Magadan. Given guns that are either crude or non-functional, if we push west, if the push west is to happen, we need to reform them into a proper army, a uh, professional army. We have several options for how we can approach this. The first is to adhere to a doctrine suited for our local force. After all, Russians know how to best fight on Russian soil. The second is to request American advisors, those experienced in the proxy wars of the world, could win Russia as well. Last is the option of adopting werewolves techniques and assembling our forces. Actis will not disappoint us. Whichever we choose, the grand task will continue. Now I know for a fact I did choose the mercenary force last time. So if you're worried about this, please go ahead. Uh, soldiers without borders. God, I love this 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 uh uh path in the campaign. I love Werbel's uh path. It's so much fun. So much fun. But a local force. Um as much as I would do a foreign force, I think I'm gonna go with a local force just because we're the Russian fascist party. We want a pure fascist run. Um I would love to get basic training. That would be so good to get. And superior firepower would be good as well. Like I wanna get that one as well, and then maneuver warfare. I mean these are all give you benefits, but we'll probably go down to local force, which is pretty good too. You get 35% more max planning. You get uh, you go from disgruntled veterans to widespread cronyism, so you can work on your army professionalism even more. And the Siberian school, which gives you a lot better uh, supply consumption and division defense, but a local force. A long time ago, during the Civil War and the Revolved Revolution, Mikovsky was an officer cadet in the White Army before the news of defeat drove him south to Manchuria. Most of our current military staff are from a similar background, White Army officers driven out from the motherland, seeking shelter in a foreign country while planning to seek their return. In the meantime, they're adamant that only Russian tactics and strategy can win in Russian soil, a view that Mikovsky personally shares but is yet to endorse. If we choose to adopt this path, we will not request any more American support outside of war material, and we will rebuff Werbel, who is only looking out for his own mercenaries. Russians know Russia best, and after all, in the tactics of the Russians, both red and white shall unite to lift the motherland from her knees. Our duty is heavy and divine, a cross that only a Russian can bear, or only Russians can bear. Magadan Free Radio, Broadcast 45. <coughs> the Siberian hunters sat around a table. On it uh, was a radio, an American brand, powered by batteries instead of regular electricity. They brought this from an admittedly sketchy merchant selling American goods in the port of Magadan. Still, the surface of the thing was shining with polish, a particularly American brand of burnishing that made cheap things look luxurious. They turned the dial to Magadan Free Radio, whose frequency had scribbled onto a piece of paper earlier. The mix was better this time. As usual, they played Russian patriotic songs with the Siberian hunters, singing and humming along to the melody, despite having no idea as to what the lyrics were. Instead of cutting entirely, the radio quieted as the talk show began. Welcome to Magadan Free Radio, a chorus voice uh, with some lip smacking, but not as much before. Your only voice or source of news in the Far East. I'm here with my co host, Vasily. Hello, a smooth baritone with some genuine cheer in how we talk now. Tonight is another cold night in Siberia, but rest assured, the MRF will go nowhere. What is our subject tonight, Sergei? Well, I hold in my hand a, genuinely, a genius American invention, Mr. Vasily. A deodorant. Truly magnificent. Sergei uncapped the deodorant, making sure to be as audible as possible. Pop. Smell that, Mr. Vasily? Hmm, and what does it do, Sergey? It's just a thing. It blocks body odor. Sergey stepped as if applying it over his skin. This deodorant, imported from America, should fit all of you Siberian savages out there in the woods. The room was silent. Mr. Facility, why are you staring at me like that? Looks like they still need work on their presentation. And me, on my speaking skills. A uh, local force is exactly what we need. Making progress. <clears throat> in the months of Mikoski's scathing inspection of the Magadan garrison, things t seemed to go from bad to well. Surprisingly good. Mikoski's general and administration. Uh, taken upon themselves to figure out some ways to improve the RFP's uh, fighting cap capability. The answer was simple, mused one senior officer. When we realized we couldn't use conscripts, we bought soldiers from uh, abroad instead. Indeed, mercenaries and military advisors, state-sponsored or otherwise, have been slowly but surely streaming into the frozen port of Magadan to not only pad Mikoski's army of ill-suited conscripts, but to train them as well to crack the web and bring them kicking and screaming into the world of professionalism. The fat ones were now skinny, the malnourished ones they healthy. 
All of them had a semblance of fighting spirit for the first time ever, and the guns, while still archaic, were at least cleaned and maintained properly. Training as bar bones as it was, actually began to prepare the conscripts and their mercenary counterparts for the realities of modern warfare in the frigid forests and marshes of the Siberia. All this, of course, was tacked onto a very long and expensive bill that Mikowski had passed off to his administration. He was confident that it would be something for them to pay the mercenaries with. After Mikowski's second inspection of the troops, which, uh, like the first, was kept as a surprise, he once again called a meeting with his general staff. As if I would end worried that the new inspection would not be enough of an improvement from the original, many nervously fiddled with pens, reports, or others, while others looked anywhere but Mikowski, where Mikowski stood. As they all assembled, the boss spoke. After the second inspection, he said, and his normal reserve manner, I want to say good job to all of you. Many were surprised. I know that the task I assigned to you is not an easy one. And while we're far from perfect, I am pleased with the prog progress we're making. The path to seek out mercenaries and foreign support was not one that I would have expected. It was clearly working, and I will be meeting with some top advisors about how to increase the numbers and effectiveness of these foreigners, and then, finally, the rare thank you. Dismissed. Now we're getting somewhere, everyone. We're getting somewhere. Wide Army Tactics. In the almost forgotten past, faintly remembered even by Mikoski himself, the Russia was divided into two factions, the Whites and the Reds. The Whites fought for the preservation of the divinely ordained order in Russia, while the Reds fought for the establishment of the Workers' Utopia, though the Reds or the Whites found themselves defeated by the Reds. Their tactics and strategy, strategy allowed them to continue fighting longer than otherwise they could have. Adopting their doctrines, particularly as it pertains to the Far East, is an excellent idea. Our officers will study the underpinnings and principles of the old white army, applying them to training our own armed forces. Though reminiscent of tactics used in the First World War, soon the conditions and harshness of Siberia will hammer a coherent doctrine out of it. The men of the old order shall not shall look upon us from the heavens. We shall not disappoint them today, nor anytime soon. Get more organization, recruitable population factor, out of supply, reinforce rate is 30%. Wow! And max planning went up by a whole bunch. Jesus. Nice. This is good, and a successful raid. Seize all we can use. Now, I want to keep going down this way, which is important, but I want to get to this gun as fast as possible so we can actually start making this quickly, 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 quickly. And do infrastructural reserves as well. But once again, I do apologize for my speech. I'm slowing my speech a little bit just because... I don't know. I feel like I've been reading this a little bit too fast. <clears throat> and I'm sure some of you guys are going to be like, Can you slow down, Mr. Muckle Lover? And I'm like, I'll try to, and then I won't. Because I won't remember. My apologies. We actually have quite a few divisions, which is awesome. Legacy of the Union. The Reds are our enemies. There is no question about that. Their military doctrine, however, is a subject of great interest to our officers. It was they who won the war over the Whites in the Civil War. It was they who held the Germans at bay, even as they pushed the AA line. If the stories from the West are correct, it was they who drew the Germans back, reclaiming much of the secret soil of the motherland. Endorsing their ideals and setting their tactics are two different things, a difference our officers are keen to keep in mind. Our officers shall scour the records in the town of Magadan and piece together a coherent doctrine from whatever we can salvage. The Reds' combination of forest concentration and industrial might will serve us well, from the far east to the western ends of Siberia, or Russia. Perhaps given time, we can finish the job the Reds have failed to accomplish. The Germans shall not dally on Russian soil for too long. Awesome. Just get improvements, more improvements. The Siberian School. With an intense study of the military doctrines and principles of the Whites and Reds, the Army of the Party in Magadan has become a professional armed force, combining them both into a form that is truly Russian while retaining its specialized nature for Siberia. Without relying on the help of the outsiders, Mikoski and his party have f crafted a military force capable of fighting in the cold and bitterness of Siberian winter. Or weather. The splitters uh, in Chita and Amur, along with the Reds in Buratia and Irkutsk, will learn to fear us now. It's time to take this army against them. The army of the party shall arm them, and our officer corps shall staff them. We're now, we now control the most dangerous force in the east, Far East, and no one can stop us centuries from now. Men and women shall sing of the great heroes of the Far Eastern territories, the soldiers who served and studied in the Siberian school, whose city marched, freed Russia, and took her to the world stage. Yes. How many guns we got? Wow. We have actually a surplus of artillery. That is awesome. We don't have a lot of divisions, which sucks. So I, I want our divisions better. We can't even get motorized here. God dang it. Um, we don't have a manpower either. I want to throw in some recon, just in case. We don't have enough. If we're going, we will have enough soon enough. If we're going to have a division, we're going to make them really good for now. So, Ready at last. The reforms of the Siberian army is complete. We're now ready to confront our old ad adversary. Rozhetsky currently residing in Namur. Our army is ready to mend the old split of the RFP at at uh, last. Some of our most seasoned veterans have been dreaming of this day ever since Mikoski's capture of Magadan. The party shall be won again after all these years. Mikoski and his officers will order all personnel to stand and buy and prepare for the operation against Amur, effective immediately. <clears throat> Our victory is assured, so long as everything that we have planned goes our way. The only wild card on the table is Werbel, the mercenary that Von Syatsky brought with him, hopefully. We have kept him on a tight enough leash that he does not do anything that would interfere with our plans, but some are among our ranks note his rising power and doubt that our current measures aren't enough. And nevertheless, the operation must go forward. Oh, do we have another... Oh, look at this. Oh, yeah, it's an elite division. What do you like? 15? No, that's not bad. No, not bad. Not perfect, but not bad. Can we do any raids here yet? No, we cannot. That sucks. Okay. So get ready. Get ready. Did you lose territory? I feel like we've lost territory here or something. 
the Little Siberian Rangers. Today is a f uh, well, actually, well, ooh, I want to use you. That's better. Yeah. Uh, today is the fifth day of a legs survival training. The sky was dark and the woods stretched into what seemed like eternity. Or infinity. In front of over remnants of a campfire and the results from the last hunt last night. Two foxes and a rabbit. Waking up to the greet of the new day, he lifted his sidearm and looked over it, balancing it in his hands as he did so. Apart from some dirt stains that was clean, he pressed the magazine release and then pulled back the slide. A cartridge flew into the air with a faint ping. All the bullets, of course, were there. So far, Oleg did not have to use his gun on anything. <clears throat> no bear, no leopard, no, nothing came even close. Although he did see them in the wild, the foxes, rabbits, and other sort of animals he hunted were the result of his traps. Using the gun on them would ruin their flavor and make them possibly unsafe and uh, unsafe to eat. To survive, Oleg learned one must be ready not to only exercise force, but also restraint. <clears throat> he picked up the stray bullet and shoved it back into the magazine. Time for his daily ritual. Sitting himself down, Oleg began taking apart his gun. Sitting the parts down on dried rabbit fur, he took out his canteen, started cleansing the parts delicately. After each piece was free of grime and dust, he rubbed them on his fur on the fur, making sure they were dry. With his icy fingers, he assembled the gun. To see if anything was wrong, he slid the magazine back and cocked the action. A snap. A leg smile. Today was a good day, too. The Siberian Rangers will come back from him any day now. Mogadon and Free Radio broadcast 60. So, Vasily, tonight we have something new to showcase to the audience, the chorus voice said. Our poor listeners cannot see into this office, but let me describe it to you, a loyal followers of the Vaz who just turned in, tuned in tonight. A pause and a thud. Whoops, sorry, dropped it. Another pause, before the same voice, beaming with excitement. This is an American-made M1911, courtesy of our friends in the CIA. <clears throat> Please don't wave that around, Sergei, a smooth baritone said. Evidently, Vasily, the ga that gun is loaded. <sighs> Apology, dear audience, it appears my friend Sergei is a bit of an idiot. <laughs> Don't be so negative, Vasily, so like I said, getting more and more excited by the minute. This weapon has a safety here, that. Uh, the pull of the trigger, click, click, click. Nothing happened. That's because the safety is preventing the firing mechanism from engaging. Fancy and clever people, these Americans. <coughs> and what does this weapon have that Russian, Russian ones don't? Well, you see, Vasily, I clapped to Ezra Sergei set the pistol down on a surface somewhere. This gun is a powerful rifle, condensed into a compact and easily carried package, making even the least armed of our soldiers dangerous. A pause. Let me pick that up again and show you how it's done. Please don't wave that around. Tinnitus rang, a discordant sound that seemed to shatter any resemblance of coherence. What the F did you... <clears throat> Just another day in the office of the MRF. Or MFR. A port for Langley. Transmission agent Mason currently stationed in Magadan. Subject, on the training and equipment of Makoski's forces. A review. Content. Before we came to the town of Magadan, acting <clears throat> at the behest of the Congress, as well as the Department of Defense, in good favor to the leader of the RFP, Makoski, most of the... Armed forces consisted of fascist militias with little or no experience in national warfare. Their equipment was in a similarly poor state, with most soldiers equipped with cra cre cracking, creaking, almost non-functional rifles like the old Arasaka models and Mosinagans, dating back to the days of the Great War. A good fit for an army of wax models in a museum, perhaps, but not enough for a host with intent to fight. As a Vaz, J Russian leader, humbly put it, a total crusade to save Russia. <clears throat> we commenced, treating as soon as we p pinned down the RFP situation. That is where we encountered another problem. The nepotism ingrained within the officer corps of the RFP was so prevalent. The men who could barely hold the weight of a rifle bore such high ranks as lieutenant, captain, or even major. Pressed on the issue, the Vaz agreed to fire these people immediately, much to his credit. He also proved the building of several officer schools that whip up the higher ranks of the army into its shape. The report we have received from the front line indicate good results. The border clashes against our neighbors have indicated a good increase in performance, regardless of victory and defeat. We will continue to monitor the situation and issue reports whenever possible. May soon now. A spectacular growth. <clears throat> Soldati Bez Granites. From the outset, Werbel's goons were different from the regulars of the RFP militias. And Magadan. They walked around town, their expensive gear strapped to their bodies, flirting with the girls and ladies they saw uh, along the way. They seemed not to have a care for Russia. It was just another playground for them. A vacation, a holiday in a desolate land where they got to shoot the natives. Smith, no given last name in particular, came from South Africa. His hands itching for the trigger of the gun. His ears for the throw of gunfire. His head and brain for the conduct and raw barbarity of combat. Werbel wasn't lying when he said this gear was good was going to be good. His M16 strapped to his back was the meanest piece of lead spitter this side of Russia. The RFP militias did not have them, only given old US M1 Garands instead, for they were not Smith. The fields, savannas, plains, and jungles of Africa made themselves known throughout his copper sunburnt skin. He had all the reasons in the world to be cocky. When his folks back home asked him why he had gone into the business to find a lady, came the answer. All who truly understood Smith knew that he wasn't in it for love, but the thrill of war and money. He could see the Russians eyeing his gear with envy in their eyes. He smirked at them and went. Every time he smoked, they would marvel at his tidy, clean, and well-rolled cigarettes. Once in a while, even he haven't offered them one. Warfare was a trade, and business was good. Leaning back against a wall in the random part of the Podunk town, he took one of his fabulous cigarettes and out and lit one. For a backwater and desert, deserted place, Magadan was pretty good, not on the level of Blomfontein, but pleasant enough. However, his heart was never there. Out west, closer to the lines of the Tsars and Rojewski's loyalists, beneath the glazing gunfire and artillery bombardments, was where he belonged. With a puff of smoke, he threw his cigarette down and stepped on it. It was time for action. Smith reporting in. The death of Olansiatsky. Mr. Vonsiatsky, are you there? Dmitri rapped on the door. Mr. Vonsiatsky, the boss is waiting for you. It's no use, Dmitri, Ivan said, sighing and catching his breath. I have been at this door for hours and haven't gotten any sort of answer yet. <clears throat> Try something else, Dmitri thought. Kneeling down, he stared at the keyhole in the doorknob. He could do this, taking out a lockpick from his pocket. 
Dimitri gingerly inserted it, working as to leave the machinations inside undisturbed and unharmed. The door had, had opened somehow, and jamming the keyhole would only make it harder for everyone. Might even require an axe, he chuckled. Ivan was about to protest several times, in fact. They could have just asked for a spare key, but Dimitri wouldn't hear of it. The door clicked. Dimitri stood, containing his jump at the very last moment. See, he said to Ivan, who gave a dry smile in response. Dimitri turned the knob, but the door wouldn't budge, bolted from inside. Gosh darn it. He kicked the door in from a fit of rage. Ivan tapped his shoulder, gesturing for him to move. Brandishing an axe, he swung it several times against the door as bits and pieces of wood fly in every direction. At the very moment, when Ivan was about to give up, the door gave way. Mr. Von Siaski, are you not we... Uh, Ivan stopped mid-sentence, laying on the floor and clutching his chest as Von Siaski, his eyes glassy, his face pale. He was dead. Sometime in the evening, the phone in Matkowski's office rang. We defer our payment to you, friend Matkowski. More relations, moderate, good. The mercenary coup. Oh, boy. Oh. Look at that. Ivan and Boris did not like the new assignment. A transfer from the political wing of the RFP to the army right before the, on the eve of the operation, they were, as the instructors put it, dead weight. An officer handed them their bolt action rifles and was told to stick with their rear guard where the chance of survival was the highest. There's no danger here, and the Siberian woods were quiet. <clears throat> the wind whistling between the trees and the cold air cold as ever. You think the boss will let us back? Boris asked Ivan, who was squatting beside him, watching the surroundings while smoking a filmsy cigarette. The only reply he got was a listless shake of the head and a hush. And hush. Ivan knew his stuff and at least showed that he wasn't in over his head. The hand that gripped the sig shook. It could be the air or even the genuine anxiety and terror in the face of war. A figure passed. In the dirt trails they were watching, a mercenary. It was apparent that the gear they carried. Proper camouflage and assault rifle, a belt chock full of grenades as well as other miscellaneous tools of warfare, and most poorly the attitude. The man walked forward without any concern or worry. His footsteps lighter than the bravest man in the RFP, however, he had no reason to be here. The front lines were where he belonged, not here. Halt, Boris said, unslinging his rifle and pointing at the mercenary did it likewise. Ivan's false suit. Turn back. The front lines are over there. The mercenary said nothing and shot at Boris. It hit, and Boris was thrown off his feet. Uh, Ivan fired back, nailing the mercenary in the shoulder. All over the lines. Incidents like these flared up. The operation was called off in a panic. Orville's coup had begun. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Oh, boy. Hopefully you can win here, too. Now look at all this. Matkowski secured. Mikowski is safe. The attempt on his life, carried out by the mercenary acquaintance available over payment disputes, have been followed by the diligence of the troops serving the party. The future leader of Russia is evacuating along with the most, his most trusted and closest associates back to Magadan. Rozhevsky is lucky. He had the betrayal not occurred. We would have crushed him, him then and there. However, another opportunity to crush him once and for all will come soon enough. Now Mikowski and his party must turn their attention to the matter of internal security. The main bulk of the mercenary army has fled the field, breaking down into squads of individual soldiers as they stagger into the waste of Siberia, while others have surrendered. The militant wing of the party shall hunt down the scattered units of mercenaries, giving them a choice to serve under Makovsky or die. We'll leave them to, to make the final decision. Either way, Makovsky has triumphed. <clears throat> if you wonder about these, please go right ahead. Taking back to what's ours. Consolidate control. We're going in even deeper. And rebuilding the future, which I love to do. This campaign is just... I love that campaign so much. For the final countdown, the mercenaries under verbal try to assassinate Mikowski. They have failed, however. Their actions have interrupted the most critical operations of the party. The attack on the moor and many of the rift of the OR, old RFP. Still, with the army assembled and taught how to fight, as well as equipped to fight the war to come, we have not lost much progress in our preparations. A little shaken by the assassination attempts, we will give the army some breathing space to compose themselves. The soldiers shall return to the barracks for a brief period. All of the equals gathered from the American supply will not go to the operation unfueled and unready. Everyone from the officers to the private shall inspect their equipment. The high command shall review their plans and judge if further preparations will be necessary. Our course is clear, and we marched into it with no doubt in our hearts. We will defeat Rozhevsky once and for all. The boss secured. Ivan carried Boris on his back. He wasn't a doctor, and he did not know whether the gunshot broke a bone, shattered a vein, or hit a vital organ. Boris was probably safe. The mercenary tagged him in his shoulders. So far, using vodka, scraps of clothing, and the bandages he found in the merc's body, Ivan had <clears throat> uh, managed to stanch the bleeding, and the blood gathering in dark red cloths beneath the bandages of his white veneer. Boris moaned every time he went up and down, crossing the rough Siberian train, but his ragged breathing... Uh, and delirious groans meant that one thing was clear. He was still, of course, alive, at least for now. All the way from the back lines of the camp, Ivan screamed until his throat was sore. Medic, medic, yet the grounds were silent. <clears throat> and the trees and bushes did not accept nor condemn his call for help. Boards were growing heavier by the minute, his weight settling into Ivan's shoulders like a cross. His breath became shorter and shorter as the woods refused to part way and yield to the camp. Not far now, Ivan thought, for every step he took, uh... Not far. Every rock, every fallen branch, and a mound of soil endeared themselves to his eyes and feet as he slowed down. He was close to fainting. Uh, his, he took his knife out and tried to prick his thumb lightly, as such it was less than gentle, and in his panic he slashed his hand. The wound was not deep, just enough to make him, keep him awake. He bandaged his hands, taking a slower measured pace. In half an hour, he reached a camp, finding it empty and deserted. Night had descended. The medical staff had fled, along with most of the troops. He, had he been faster, had he been quicker, had he been saved, he could have saved Boris. He laid his friend down on the ground and held his hand as Boris' breath faded. Fainter, fainter, he tried. He really did. Fate had not given leave for Boris to survive. Luck did, however. 
A truck horn sounded, and in their headlights was Ivan holding his friend's hand and tears at his bay. He could not believe it. Gathering his will, he said in a shaking torn voice, Friend or foe, Russian or mercenary? Friend came the reply, Russian, you are safe now. The vase awaits in Magadan. Get in the truck. Matkovsky survives. Well, I got more attack. D Day. The day has come. The army with their equipment, uh, polished and accounted for. It's ready to take on Rajeski. The artillery guns are painted, pointed in the direction of the Amur Magadan line and border. Arrange for the fire of the first shots that will ignite the showdown between the two old companions. With but a command from Mikovsky, the operation will be underway. We expect the conflict to be short, with a victory determined after a few weeks. The moment for words is over. Now alone, will, uh, might will decide that which wing of the party shall triumph. In a few days, Mikovsky shall personally sign the order to advance, and his hands in the reins of conducting the war to subordinates. Our troops shall break the uneasy and informal border between us and Rajeski. Artillery fire shall precede them, as they shatter the pathetic armed militia Rozhevsky dares to call an army. The war will begin, and Mikovsky shall succeed. After that, the rest of Russia awaits. But, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I will see you tomorrow when we will begin the war against Amur. Thanks for watching, have a great, 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 great rest of your day.